the Kicking It With Doree show. I'm your host, Doree Allen Nieves, and I'm very excited to have my friend Keisha Monk on the show today. She is a radio vet, a VO vet. I'm very, very honored to speak with her today. Even though, like, we're cool and everything, I'm still like, oh. <laughs> Are you serious right now? <laughs> but yeah, listen, listen. I'm going to tell the story in a second, but let me first introduce you, okay? Let me make sure that everyone knows how great this person is. Keisha Monk's professional career began as a radio personality. Her talent took her to many cities across the country, including major markets such as New York, LA, Chicago. After 20 years in radio, her career path shifted to voiceover after a devastating cancer diagnosis. She managed to obtain representation almost instantly and hasn't looked back since. Her work includes things like Emily's List, being the promo voice for POV, which is a weekly documentary series that airs on PBS, and live announcing the Soul Train Music Awards, which was fab that just came out a couple weeks ago. So yes, girl, let me give you the Whitney clap. <laughs> oh, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> yes, and yes, I am serious because I remember, um, we have not met in person before yet, you know, COVID be damned, but, um, I remember either last year, she has hosted the Soul Train Music Awards a few times, okay? So it was either last year or two years ago or three years ago. I remember that a mutual friend had commented on a post on Facebook regarding her announcing um, Soul Train. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I'm like only two or three degrees of separation from this chick? Wait, what? And I'm like, I wonder how I could get to her. I wonder how I could be friends with her. But I couldn't think of anything, okay? I couldn't. Because I just like to be near people that I think are great. You know, that's just a little side tip there. Always spend time with people that are great, that have, you know, been in something longer than you, that you can learn from, from that can mentor you. And so um, that didn't happen, but we both ended up joining um, a, face, a Facebook group in common. And so that is how I was able to eventually meet her and learn about her wonderful and inspirational story. So yes, I was like this, you know, I know how to keep my cool and everything, you know what I mean? I know how to keep it, you know, but on the inside, I was like, how can I be friends with her? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so welcome, Keisha. Thank you. Uh, I want you to uh, share with people your story. I know you've shared it many times, but um, no one can share it better than you. Um, talking about your background, uh, your story of longevity and perseverance. Um, you're actually my first uh, Color Vogue series guest that started from a radio background. Um, so yeah, tell us about all of that. We want to hear all the things. How did you get here? First and foremost, thank you so much for thinking enough of me to invite me to this wonderful platform that you have. I mean, seriously, it, it really means a lot to me. And as you were talking about, I guess, all of my accomplishments, I'm like, is that really me? <laughs> you never really think of, of, of yourself in, in the term. But yeah, I, I'm excited because I think that my story will inspire a lot of people, especially, you know, when it comes to my humble beginnings. Um, well, I've always um, ha had a, a musical background, per se. So my mom used to sing professionally, gospel, gospel professional, and so did my dad. And then my great uncle is the Thelonious Monk for all you jazz enthusiasts out there. So mm -hmm. I've, I've probably been playing, you know, instruments and whatnot since I was the, you know, two years old, you know, from piano, I play a violin, you know, bassoon, clarinet, oboe, like I play like a host of instruments. And I would want to think that that's how I really got into radio. Um, I, I just, I just love music, you know, music rolls through my veins. And I never really thought that I was a great enough musician to like make it big time. So I found a way to um, interject my love for music into a career. And that's really how I started in radio. I wandered up to the radio station on my college campus, little small uh, university down in North Carolina called Shaw University and HBCU. Wandered up there, I saw the, you know, the buttons and lights and the music and I'm like, I think this is what I wanna do. And so, you know, it wasn't easy. I, I was, you know, I 
folks just discouraged me, you know, oh, you'll never make it, you know, that type of story. And I think that kind of fueled me to just try harder and harder. So, you know, I started from like a public service radio station, which is basically a volunteer radio station to like moving up to commercial radio. And so I've worked in North Carolina and Pittsburgh and I did mornings in Boston and I also had a morning show with Isaac Hayes, rest in peace Isaac, in New York City. And you know, I worked uh, with Steve Harvey. My show came on right after Steve Harvey when I was in LA and just all these different things. I just, it was crazy. Like I always felt like it was never enough to do what I, what I, what I really, you know, if I was like in, in LA, I'm like, you know what? I wanna work in New York and that's what I'm gonna do. And then I made it happen. Mm -hmm. And so, like you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, um, back in 2012, I was diagnosed with um, colon cancer and it really knocked me off my feet. I was so, so sick. I lost the ability to walk. I lost my teeth, my hair fell out. I had to have many, many different, you know, um, surgeries, not just um, a removal of part of my colon, but I had to have a hysterectomy. I had to have, you know, um, part of my thyroid taken. I just, just all this stuff. And I couldn't work in radio anymore. This is after a successful career. It broke my heart, but at the same time, I just felt that um, I had to persevere, you know? And so I was, you're gonna, cr you're gonna crack up at this. So I was on the internet one day and I saw a contest to win a six-figure voiceover contract. Now, even though I was in radio all this time and I had, you know, recorded commercials and things like that, I really didn't know what voiceover is all about. And as you know, and what some people probably don't know watching this, voiceover is a whole lot more than just reading, you know, a commercial. You know what I mean? You need to be able to make those words on the paper really, really jump off of the page and you have to be compelling in so many different ways, you know, uh, as you compare the, it to radio, it's just not the same. It's a lot more complex. I didn't know what voiceover was, but I knew I had a voice. So, you know, I entered the contest and then I made it to round two and then round three and it was a nationwide contest and I made it to the final 10. They told me to read this script that was in, the, in an envelope. I open the envelope, and what do you know? It's a script about cancer. And I'm like, no freaking way. No way. <laughs> so I read, I'm sorry. I, I read the script, and it wasn't hard to be, you know, to, to try to connect the audience because cancer was my reality. I barely got through it, but I read it and everybody's in awe, like, oh my God. They didn't know that I was going through cancer, you know, and they're, you know, they were singing praises and that was great. And fast forward, I didn't win the contract, but they offered me a, you know, I didn't win the contest, but they offered me a contract anyway. Okay. And that's how it really started, you know? And I know somebody's like, damn, she's crying again. I'm sorry. It's very, it's very emotional. I just feel I like apologize it, for that. I mean, I know, but it's just, it's just amazing when I think about all that I went through and how and where I am today. You know, and I still have many, many levels to climb still. I'm nowhere near wh where I want to be, but I'm just so unbelievably blessed and, and lucky um, to have experienced the success that I have, but more importantly, to be able to share my story. And for that, I'll be ever grateful for you. I mean, because what's a story if you don't have anybody to tell it to, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Keisha, you have told your story so many times and every time you do, um, just in the short time that I've known you, every time you do, even though I know it, I still reread it. I still mm -hmm. just, I, I reread it again, like as if I've mm -hmm. never seen a post about anything from you because <laughs> it's a good reminder. Sometimes we think 
oh, well, you know, I keep talking about this thing, so maybe I'm not over it, or I keep talking about this thing and people might be tired of hearing it. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes what you're, when you're telling your story, uh-huh. it's for your edification, and sometimes it's for someone else's edification. And I think for me, the reason that I continue to reread those posts where you reminisce or you have an anniversary of, you know, being, you know, in remission or what have you, mm-hmm. it's because it's a good reminder. We get complacent as humans. We just do. We get complacent, even if we're generally grateful and we need a reminder to be like, oh yeah, you know what? I've been complaining about stuff and I've been feeling a way about this thing over here. Let me yeah. remind myself of the big picture. You know what I mean? I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. And yes. so don't ever apologize again for <laughs> crying or for sharing your story or feeling like it's too much because it could either be for your edification, someone else's, or both. And we all need to acknowledge that no matter how much we've accomplished, you know, or how much we've done or how far we've come, it could have been another way because maybe we won't even be here right now. There's people that we all know that are not here right now that we think should be here. Um, Absolutely. So that, I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> so all now, right. the wonderful story, and we know that, that there, there's deeper layers to this. Yeah. What made you want to become a voice talent? Was it something that happened in your radio days or was it because of that contest and they didn't pick you or something else? All right, well, I got to be real raw with it. It, It's, this is the truth. I had low self-esteem and I felt that if I embraced a career that didn't require me to be seen, then that was for me. That was for me. And radio, it's kind of like that, you know, where, you know, of course you're in a studio and it's you and the microphone. There are millions of people listening to you, but I, I, I didn't live under the pressure of having to be seen all the time. I used to cringe when they asked me to do personal appearances and things like that. Um, but I dealt with it because I just figured, well, I only have to be out here for two hours. I'll get that over. But once I made the transition to voiceover, that was ideal for me because I did not have to be seen. Didn't have to be seen. I just, I fa- faced a lot of um, racism. You know, growing up as a child, you know, I, my mom always made sure that I received the best education possible, and that required me to go to school outside of my district. So I've always been one of maybe two or three African American girls in a class of like 30 people. And so um, I just always grew up with this complex. Even my own friends, you know, that lived on the block or over at my aunt's house, they used to call me darky, blacky, patent leather shoe, like, you know, I was very dark skinned. And so, you know, growing up with low self esteem for a very, very long time, it, it kind of forced me to embrace a career that I didn't have to be front row and center. So that's really what, <laughs> one of the reasons why. I felt that voiceover would be absolutely perfect for me. And then it ended up being something completely else once you got into it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So what are your what are your ultimate goals? I shared some of your accomplishments when I read your bio, but what are some of your your goals? What is like your dream? Well, I want to fill a void and I want to break barriers. What does that mean? I want to tread and swim in territories that black women generally don't swim in. (laughs) Not only being, you know, black, but also being a woman. You don't hear a lot of women doing movie trailers. Um, You certainly don't hear about a lot of black women doing, um, you know, animation. You know, we're here, we're out there. But I just, I want to be able to be a part of a movement per se. So, you know, a lot of uh, character work. I would love to um, become the first Black Siri, you know, um, Mm. you know, things like that. I I just, 
even those at, at times, because, you know, being a voiceover, and I'm sure you know this, could be very discouraging at times. You are told no much more than you are told yes. Um, rejection is definitely a part of the voiceover industry. But I kind of look at it differently. You know, with every no, which is a lot, <laughs> I'm always, you know, I always go back and I, and I listen um, to what, I could have done wrong. And a lot of times you'll audition for like a television spot and you'll see the television spot on, on you know, you'll see it actually being aired. And I like to compare and contrast. I'll record it and then I'll take my, you know, long story short, I just want to, I just want to explore areas of this, of this industry that haven't really been touched by black women. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what history says. I don't care if 99% of the movie trailers, for instance, are done by white men. I don't care. I'm, I, I like to go after things that seem impossible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. if that answers your question. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I think about that all the time, too. I think about how, you know, like for instance, promo is slowly shifting to allow more black men in, but I still don't really hear, I don't think I've heard any that I'm aware of, uh, black women doing promo voices, except for our friend Mia. Um, right. right. So, you know, and I actually, if you don't know who I'm talking about, I actually did um, an interview with her um, that you can also find where she talks about some stuff. We don't particularly talk about promos, but, mm -hmm. Those are definitely two areas, the trailers and promos, where you hear very few, if any, like maybe zero, uh, Black women. I'm just going to say if, just in case somebody's like, oh, no, I know this one person. Okay, well, we know one person, too. Right. One, we know one person, too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, by me being so, you know, uh, adamant about getting into these spaces, I think it's almost um, a way to open up, allow the floodgates to open. You know what I mean? If, if I'm persistent about doing more promo and doing, you know, trailers and things like that, I believe somewhere deep down inside that it could open up the door for other Black women to, you know, um, to, to, you know, tread in these, in these territories. So I, I'm going to do it. I promise you I will. That's what I was gonna say. You know, I've got a teenage daughter. She is 17, uh -huh. and maybe a couple months ago, she was just like, "Okay, you know what? You make money doing voiceover. I think I want to do that." And I'm like, "Oh, do you?" <laughs> I said, "Well, ma'am. I said, first of all, the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to watch every YouTube video in my mm -hmm. playlist about starting in voiceover. Yes, you can handle watching all of those videos and taking in." you know, the information that I give there, because each video is less than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do all of that with free content and absorb it and take it seriously. Then I'll talk to you. And that's yeah. my daughter. So you yeah. know what I do when just random people come in. Yeah. At me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Watch the videos first. Yeah. Okay. We're old enough that we still like YouTube. You know, some of the younger ones, you know, my daughter was kind of like, oh, it's not on Instagram. It's not on TikTok. No, this is not a TikTok. TikTok topic right right and a lot of people so, just and depending on when people are watching this it's like okay well or listening to this um you know they're gonna be like what's tiktok tiktok is so you know that's so 2020 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, <right? laughs> you know what i mean it's like you blink about. and there's something new yeah 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 i get it what is speaking of you know people that you know are interested in getting into voiceover what is the one thing that you would advise somebody that says akisha i want to do what you do how do you get started what would you tell them about getting into the vo business well number one you got to understand what voiceover is it's not something that you think you can get into just because you have a nice voice in fact that's the least of your worries you know listen my husband is a, a is a sports fanatic right he loves sports, any type of sports you can think of. He's, he will watch a Frisbee competition, you know, if it's on. <laughs> and I let him do his thing, but when a commercial comes on, you have my complete, <laughs> complete attention. And so what I've noticed over the past, you know, year or two is that voiceover isn't really about having a nice voice. You know, we're in the era of realness and connectability you know, real people. And so 
a lot of voices that you hear on television, radio, you know, so forth and so on, they may not have this melodious, beautiful, you know, it's, it's just about real people. And so understand what voiceover is. It's not about you having a nice voice. It's about your ability to connect that script with the people who are listening to it, okay? That ain't easy to do. And I've been doing this for seven, eight years and I still get hung up on being real or, you know, or, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's not easy. Like so how I, real do you want? Right, exactly. <laughs> That's the, it, it's crazy, but it's the hardest thing to do in my opinion. So understand what voiceover really is. That's number one. And then the other thing is if you don't have the, the a skin tough enough to accept rejection and not be willing to learn from that, then this definitely ain't for you. It ain't for you. Before I um, upgraded my computer, I you know, tried to save files from my original computer. I probably have in upwards of 15,000 auditions. I really do. And of course, this is over the course of maybe four or five years. I would say maybe I booked 15% of that. Do you know how many rejections that is, you know, from a mathematical, pers you know, uh, perspective? You have to be willing to get rejected and learn from it. And I'm not necessarily saying, you know, you can't be human because a lot of times I have auditioned for things that I was real butt hurt over. <laughs> um, I mean... <laughs> I really was, I'm sorry. I was butt hurt, you know, and still to this very day, as much as I, you know, as much um, ex uh, success I, as I have experienced, I still get my feelings hurt from time to time. Some of these spots, I'm jobs I really, really want, but mm -mm. you have to realize that you're not the only one auditioning for this. A lot of times you could be auditioning for something that 50 other people are auditioning for. The stakes are very high when it comes to this kind of stuff. And some of those people could be your friends. So you yeah. have to sort of like figure out, okay, am yeah. I going to be salty because I think that my VO that I submitted was better than the product? Or am I going to try to be happy for my friend and colleague that right. did a good job, but still right. it's like that doesn't match the specs that we were given in exactly. order to submit the audition in the first place. You know what? In addition to that, you also might be auditioning next to someone who has a world of experience. You know what I'm saying? I had an in-person audition and it was at some, you know, casting agency in New York City. And, you know, it was for like a pharmaceutical commercial, you know, don't take this if you are allergic to so-and-so and so you might die. You know, one of those commercials. <laughs> yeah, my favorites. I love right. pharma. But you know, I love those type of commercials, mainly because I kind of come from that era. You know what I'm saying? I, I could be a doctor. I am a doctor without the degree because I've been through so much medically. So I really, really wanted it. And I practice and I'm like, I'm going to get this spot. And I'm sitting down. It was like a, um, what do you call it? A, a, a What is it? A cow? A cattle call? Cattle call? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. When you're just competing with a whole bunch of people? Yeah. And I'm there on this bench and this lady is sitting next to me and she's you know she she's she's got her leg she's sitting in indian like an in indian pose and you know she's drinking her you know water and you know she's just doing all this stuff and, and i'm like so what I, this job is mine i don't care you know so the casting agent comes out and he's like amy she's sitting right here and she's like, yeah, I didn't know you were the agent for this. And they're like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I was, um, I was watching um, Grey's Anatomy and I saw you. I, you know, I saw you in like almost every episode. Like, yeah, that's me. Like, totally, you know, I'm like, then my excitement kind of was a gut punch. I'm like, am I really competing against this lady who's been on Grey's Anatomy every week like really so it was you know back to our original point you have to understand 
that you are basically in line when you're auditioning for something, there could be 50, 75 other people auditioning for it. So you are going to get rejected time from time to time. And in my instance, you are going to get rejected a whole lot. But rejection makes me more hungry. Rejection kind of um, gasses me up. I just feel like, okay, I didn't get it this time. And a lot of times it may not even be your performance that, uh, that caused the rejection. You know, it, it could be, you know, that the casting agent or the client, you know, her niece was <laughs> auditioning for the right. same. There are exactly. always a lot of different elements with regards to why you get rejected. It's not always that you suck. You know what I'm saying? Every single situation, uh, you know, it could be a different circumstance. But welcome that rejection. Welcome it from time to time. Get sad, but snap out of it understand you know try to make yourself sound better or just try to you know compare and contrast watch more commercials get a coach if you want to um but never you have to have tough skin to be in this business you really really do absolutely um yeah. and to your point about rejection um i personally have mm -hmm you know, issues with rejection. I've overcome a lot, but I think there'll always be a little something there just, you know, on a personal um, level, of course. just um, yeah. you know, with uh, work. But I think that sometimes what's helpful for us are, are if our initial reaction is that we're being rejected for these jobs or that the industry does that because that is the nature of the business. It's very subjective and you don't know, can't get in everyone's brain and, and figure out what they're thinking and what they really want because they can't always convey that. Um, I think a helpful way to reframe it is to say, you know what, I wasn't rejected. I just wasn't selected. I wasn't selected for this part. I now, like that. You can still feel a way about it, and I do, and you do, and all of us have at some point. But reframing it and saying, you know what, I wasn't rejected, like, again, like, to use your words, you suck. It's more so that you just weren't selected for this. But guess what? That those 15%, even though it's a smaller number, it is a numbers game. And you um, were selected for those 15% of the jobs. So it's mm -hmm. like, if you reframe it that way, you know, use that as fuel, like you said, to get better, to improve. And don't always just come to that knee-jerk reaction of, okay, well, what's wrong with me? Oh, they don't like me. You know, uh, they can't see me. Maybe, you know, they don't like the way I sound. Or maybe they went to my website and they, they Googled me and they saw that I like such and such. Or maybe it's a political thing. Or maybe they just don't right. like people. I mean, you could just go on and on with it if right. you let yourself. If you let your brain wander, it will find a zillion reasons why you're not good enough. I've been doing voiceovers now for a few years, but I actually sat on this idea for over 10 years. 10 years of thinking about it, wondering, hmm, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. I don't know how to break in. What do I do? I don't know anybody that does that. All these different doubts and doing Google searches and coming up with way too much information and not knowing where to start. So it's time for me to pay it forward. And I thought I would help others who keep asking me and DMing me, how do I get started? If you want to share your voice with the world and you're interested in starting a voiceover career or just trying to understand what it takes to get started, I can help you. I created a free resource guide that has links to courses, training, blogs, Facebook groups, and tons of things that'll give you good information to get started and not overwhelm you. These are resources that I've curated myself and they've served me well as I've started on this journey. Want yours? Sign up and get yours free at bit.ly slash Doree voiceover resource bit.ly slash Doree voiceover resource. If you already know this is something you want to do, you can just go straight to the e-course at bit.ly slash vocality dash e-course. That's why my mantra is audition and let it go. Audition and let it go. It's easy to obsess. I mean, I have auditioned for some huge job. I have auditioned for like some Disney you know, some, some stuff for Disney and some like major motion films. And you know, you know that after I auditioned, I go, to, I wouldn't have a slip. I have sleepless nights for weeks waiting to hear from it. But I, you have to audition and you have to let it go. Like you said, you can be human with it. 
you know, of course I cried, but you have to audition and let it go. But you have really, I love the way you put that. I wasn't rejected. I just wasn't selected. Mm -hmm. That's how I got this time. You weren't selected this time. Mm -hmm. What about next time? You never know. You don't do it. I love it. I love that. Okay. All right. (laughs) Okay. So let me, uh, wrap this up. I know we've been talking for a while. We could probably talk a lot longer. We have talked on the phone a lot longer because yeah. that's what we do. We're voice people. We love to talk. We're girlfriends. I mean, hello. hello. Uh, but <laughs> how would you, with all that said, everything that you've been through thus far, overcoming all these challenges, in addition to just living on this earth in a pandemic, being a wife and a mom, um, what would you, how would you define success? That's a tough one. How would I define success? At least for, you know, right now. This this is not, you know, you're not going to be held to this definition for life. Well, I don't know if this makes sense. But what I've discovered as of late, especially with it being 2020 and everything, success to me is being able to achieve peace of mind that sounds so silly but let me explain the world is such a noisy place especially with social media you know it's just noisy there are tons of distractions Um, you know the news cycle is just crazy it's just so much going on but in order for you to really achieve your goals in 2020 has taught me this You have to be able to find what it is that gives you peace. Because if if you're able to achieve peace, then you're able to achieve everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just, you have to be able to, and I've said this before in, in other groups and things like that, you have to be able to kill the noise. Once you do that, whatever it is, Whatever it is, if you wake up in the morning and feel like I just want to, you know, just be able to, um, you know, exercise today, even though it may seem small to some people, being able to get up and to just move, it's a big deal. You can be successful in doing that, but you have to be able to kill the noise. You know what I mean? You have to be able to, and not sacrifice your peace, you know? So that, that, that seems kind of broad, but that's kind of what I think about with regards to achieving success. You know what I mean? Achieving, I mean, taking control of your mindset and your peace is definitely going to lead towards success because like you said, you're not in a, you, you know, your brain is focused. You're not worried about the stuff that doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're going to get rejected or not right. selected and you're right. going to be like, ah, all right, well, let me see what's next and move right. on. You're, you're going to be able to be more resilient and be able to, and you know all about resilience, yes, be able to be resilient and bounce back from things because in life, sometimes, you know, actually most of the time, it's not just one thing that gets to us. It's like a bunch of things at once. It's usually yeah. we don't have the luxury of dealing with one setback or one issue at a time. We usually have to juggle multiple things tugging at us, but we can lighten that load a bit if we decide to not take on too much, you know, and this is probably getting into a whole nother topic, but kind of like when it comes to time management, productivity, that helps a lot with your piece because, you know, you're a voice actor, you're an entrepreneur, freelancer, business owner, however you want to label yourself, and you have to manage a lot of things. Even if you have a virtual assistant. You have to manage them too. So you have to manage a lot of things just with work and it's easy to get bogged down in it. So the more things that you can take off your plate and focus and decide what is really important in my life right now, you don't necessarily have to commit to it forever until you die, but what is the most important thing for me right now? And I know, you know, this is um, going live at a time when you know, people are setting goals for the new year, but it doesn't really matter when you're watching or listening to this podcast. Um, All that really matters is that you try to get clear and focused on what it is 
that you think will contribute to your happiness right now and what should you let go of? It could be a thing. It could be pursuing a person. It could be a relationship. And I don't right. necessarily mean a spouse or significant other. It could be a friendship, any kind of relationship. There's so many things we need to evaluate in order to um, decide how we're going to reclaim our peace. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, what taught me that is just dealing with cancer because I was diagnosed in 2012, but I was, you know, I had a bunch of reoccurrences. So just imagine if I didn't have that mindset and I was just ready to give up. It's yeah. like I've always subscribed to the belief that there is life and death in the power of the tongue. So just imagine if, <laughs> it's funny, I'm just remembering when I was first diagnosed, the doctor told me, oh, this is bad. You might not make it. Like she didn't have any bedside manners. Just imagine if I would have taken that and internalized that. So that's what I, you know, getting back to your original question, success of course is subjective for different people. But if you're just willing to defy the odds, to make sure you understand what it's like to kill the noise and just make sure that you are at least willing to try to get a little bit of determination, again, for whatever it is that you want to do, you can do it. You definitely can do it. I wanted to work in New York. I wanted to. I didn't know how, but I said, you know what? I'm going to work in New York. Just like I'm telling you that I'm going to be a movie trailer voice, I'm going to make it happen. I don't know how, but right. that is success. Mm -hmm. yep. success. You decide now and you worry about the steps later. You there I mean? you go. But so many people have goals that they're setting or resolutions, whatever. And yes. they're like, okay, well, I really want to do this, but I don't know how to get there. So I'm just going to like, eh, that's all right. Yeah. It's, just, it's just too hard. It's just too confusing. Yeah. It's too much. So, nah. Eh. And if they get want, frustrated. If you want it bad enough, you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. You can make exactly. it happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, Keisha, my last question for you, or yes. my next to last question, because who knows what else I'm going to think of, <laughs> is um, <laughs> what advice would you give to your younger self? And it could be, you know, the little girl that was told that she was too dark, or it could be, you know, the Keisha of last year. You know, people in general, they, they will, and it's, it's crazy, I kind of wish I was a a psychologist at times, so I could understand the mind of, of certain people. There are people who are basically on this earth who discourage you from everything in life. I don't understand that. <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> really quick story. I, again, I'm the type of person who loves filling voids, right? So when I got married, back in 2003, I noticed that there was nothing on the internet or even on the newsstand that catered to the bride of color. So I had this big, I had this vision, you know, I'm going to come up with something where African American brides can, you know, meet virtually and share ideas and tips and encourage each other because, you know, planning a wedding is so stressful and all this kind of stuff. And I ended up doing that. But when, as it grew, I said, you know what, I think I can make this into a television show. I definitely can do this. So I had a lot of meetings with a bunch of networks, BET, TV One, people who should understand, you know, the concept of filling voids. That's why they exist. And, you know, they, they told me like, you know, black people don't get married that much. So long story short, yeah, it happened. That's a whole, look, if you want to invite me back to talk about that one day, we can't. Yeah, they did. They did. I, I, I have the tapes to prove it when they told me this stuff. Um, as a child, especially, you know, how impression, impressionable ch children are, you can't allow anybody to tell you what you can and cannot do. That is just crazy to me. I went on and created my own thing. And that's a prime example of how you just can't listen to people. I don't care if, you know, if, if they have as much prestige as they want. I don't care if it's the president. You know, people cannot tell you what you can and cannot do. If you want it bad enough, you definitely can make it happen. So once again, as I'm repeating myself, kill the noise. Kill it. Kill it. 
Don't listen, listen to your inner voice, listen to your inner thoughts and go for it, period. Absolutely. Um, maybe I'm going to call this episode, Kill the Noise. Kill the Noise. <laughs> Like that. Yeah. Kill of the noise, though. No. <laughs> yeah, and, and download what is it, Public Enemy? You put the little instrumental in the background. Kill the noise. Tell me why I get it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. So, what's up next for Keisha? What's up next? Girl, I don't know. I don't know. 2020, man. 2020 is just. I was thinking about doing this video of how. Um, of of you know comparing my experience of doing the soul train awards last year to doing it this year because last year you know they flew me out they gave me this really nice hotel room i walked the red carpet yeah you know, i had my own dressing room everything was you know 2020 and this year i just did i, I literally did the entire show from my studio i didn't have i had my pajamas on i probably didn't brush my teeth that morning <laughs> <You know? laughs> My plans are all jacked up and I have been through a lot this year. So what's next really, and it's kind of unrelated to VO, I need a reset. You know, I, I need a reset. I don't even know what that reset looks like, but I got to kind of recharge and re-energize and go for the big bucks. I am available for all of you agents out there that need a wonderful voice, a great, you know, a voice talent. That would be me. Uh, I, I want to get um, a, a solid agent who understands um, how talented I am. I want to be able to meet somebody who's totally going to exploit my talent. So that's, I would say that's my number one goal. And I'm giving myself till the end of January, 2021, I want to good solid agent who understands me and who will work for me so that's it awesome yeah. awesome awesome I, I i love it i receive it and i agree with you thank you, you. thank you <laughs> i appreciate it. i actually want all the same things i think i don't necessarily know if i need a reset but everything else you said <laughs> me too so i am touching <laughs> and agreeing with you from over here thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh girl. gosh Keisha, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your afternoon with me today. Um, and I hope that, you know, everything that you want is yours and more. Please tell everyone that's watching and listening how they can follow your work. Oh, well, of course, you can follow me on Facebook at Keisha Monk, K-E-S-H-A-M-O-N-K. I am also on Instagram. Keisha Monk. I'm also on Twitter, Keisha Monk. I mean, it's easy. You can also check out my website, um, which will try and change from time to time. I love uploading new projects, so forth and so on. My website address is Keisha Monk, V O.com, K E S H A, M as in Mary, O, M as in Nancy, K, V O.com. That's it. And uh, we will have all of that linked for you so that you can just nice. click and go and follow and like and all the things. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks again, Keisha. Love you. Oh. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you more. And that's, that's definitely the truth, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you for kicking it with me today on the Kicking It with Deree podcast.